Well, we're continuing our learning from the book of Romans. We're in chapter 8 today. Uh, So far we have learned that the goal of a Satan is to live in hope. We are able to do this because we are not condemned by our sin, but redeemed by our Savior, and then indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. Not the outcome of our effort, but God's response to our faith. The ministry of the Holy Spirit in the saint's life is to allow them to live above this fallen world. All of creation groans because of the impact of sin. Mankind is weakened by it, so much so that we don't even know how to pray. However, the saint has nothing to be concerned about because the Holy Spirit groans on our behalf. The child of God has the advocate in heaven, Jesus Christ, and the advocate within, the Holy Spirit. And that truth should cause us to experience hope. But those things are intangible, aren't they? What about the tangible things of this life? God wants to let us know that he is working in a tangible way to bring about all of his promises. And that's the reason for today's wonderful text. We're going to be learning that God is the cause behind everything that is going on in this world. He is working out his plan, and that plan is for his glory and your good. However, that plan is only for a select few. Those that respond to God's love and love him in return. Our text for today is one verse, Romans 8, verse 28. Let's pray. Well, Lord God, as we open your word, today's word is powerful wonderful. May the wonders of this verse be revealed to each one of us today. May you work in the words that I share to pierce into each one of our hearts the wonderful encouragement and truths from this word that you have so wonderfully given to us for our encouragement. And then, Lord God, may you empower us to live in hope in the coming days because of the truth of your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The often quoted, probably one of the verses I use in my pastoral counseling more than any verse, Romans 8, 28. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose. Now, I'll be honest with you. I have to break this verse up into more than one message. Otherwise, we'd be here for a long time. So today, we're going to just cover the first portion of this verse, starting off with, and we know. And we know. Paul starts off with this in such a, and we just, you know, it's like stating a fact. But he starts off with, and, which is very important that we understand why that word is even there. This is tying into the statement that preceded it, which is talking about the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives. His ministry is understanding our weakness. We learned that last week. Verse 26, and in some ways... In the same way the Spirit helps in our weakness. The ministry of the Holy Spirit is to to make us strong. It understands our weakness and, and comes in on our behalf in that way. It says that He groans on our behalf. The Holy Spirit is so in tune with what you're going through. He groans on your behalf. And he petitions on your behalf according to God's will that oftentimes we don't know God's will because we're so 
blinded by our own desires, blinded by our own will. The Holy Spirit knows God's will because he is God. And he petitions on our behalf according to God's will. We can trust his petitions because they're going to be in line with what God's desires are. And that's how he starts the word, this this promise. And vitally important that we understand that that's tied in with this wonderful promise of this verse. And then he says, we. And we. he wants the Roman church to know that what he is about to say is for himself as well as them. The most wonderful proclaimer of God's truth is hearing it and applying it right with you. And that's Paul. Right with them. We know these things. The journey of a Christian is done alongside others. And this is also referring that this promise that he's about to share is for we, it's for us, it's part of the family, it's for the children of God that he declared earlier in this chapter and throughout this book that we are children of God when we become born again. We, we are co-heirs with Christ. When we become born again, we are born into a new family, the family of God. God does not desire Lone Ranger Christians. And yet, because of technology today, it's so easy to be a Lone Lone Ranger Christian. Tune into YouTube and watch the most popular preacher of the day. Tune into YouTube and you can be a part of their church service. I don't mind those technologies to help out when a person can't come into church, but it's certainly not a replacement. God does not desire Lone Ranger Christians. And we know that word up there is wida, that's the Greek word for know. It means to to know, to understand, to fully comprehend, reminding us that the Christian life is about learning. We haven't arrived, we are always learning. Makes me think of a, a quote, I, I think something I'd read quite a while ago of a student at Dallas Seminary. And uh, there was a professor there named Howard Hendricks, one of the famous professors of Dallas Seminary. And uh, no matter how early the students arrived, they could see Professor Hendricks' light on in his study. And one day they asked him, he said, Prof, you've been here for years. Why are you the first one here all the time? And he says, because I haven't yet learned it all. I'm still learning. We should all have that attitude. That we're learning. We're learning. There there are always new life lessons to be learned. We have a new way of life when we're in in Christ. And it's not going to be seen in the world. It's goes against the world's nature. Paul knew they knew. He says, and we know. Paul knew they knew. Well, how did they know? Because the Holy Spirit was disclosing the truth to them. That's how Paul knew. And we know. Now, he may not have declared this truth that he's going to declare, but he knew they already knew it. And he knew that he already knew it because the Holy Spirit was disclosing to them. You see, the the source of our knowledge is the Holy Spirit. It's not my intelligence. It's not your intelligence. There's some really intelligent, dumb people out there. There's some vastly intelligent, totally lost souls out there. It's not a result of your intelligence. <clears throat> your knowledge as a Christian comes through the Holy Spirit. You see, he's the one that who inspired the writing of Scripture. He's the one that dictated to Paul. See, now write this. Now write that. <clears throat> he's the one that gives us understanding when we read it. And that's what's so exciting that when you open up a, a, a verse that you may have read a million times and then you open it and go, 
Wow, I never saw that in there before. That's really touched my heart. You see, the Holy Spirit is giving you a new understanding because that's his ministry in your life. And then he's the one that empowers you then to live out the truths of those scriptures. We don't become just proud knowledge containers. We become livers. livers. That's not the right word. (laughs) We live out the truths of scripture. And then the other truth from this knowledge is our knowledge impacts our thoughts, doesn't it? Our knowledge impacts how we think, which then impacts who we are. That's why what you think about, what you learn is so important. Look at Proverbs 23, 7. Proverbs 23, 7. Real simple first half of that verse. For as he thinks within himself, so he is. That's why what you take in as knowledge is so important because it impacts your thoughts, which then impacts who you are, who you become. And this is why our adversary has taken over our educational system. Because if he figures, if I can impact your knowledge, I can impact your thoughts, which impacts who you are. But another verse that fits in here is Philippians 4, 7. Philippians chapter 4, verse 7. It says, And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension. We all know that verse, don't we? We all understand, oh, the peace of God, that uh, it is just, I experience it, I can't describe it. What's the purpose of that? Just so that you can enjoy peace? No. It will then guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The purpose of of the peace of God, which is a ministry of the Holy Spirit in your life, is to protect your heart and your mind. You are protected by the peace of God, which is a ministry of the Holy Spirit in your life. Now let's go back to Romans chapter 8, 28. Romans 8, 28 again. And we know... And we know. How do we know? Because God gives us that knowledge. He has many practical ways of doing that, but he also has his internal way through the Holy Spirit of doing that. Then we get to the other part that I wanted us to focus on today. And we know what? That God causes. And we know that God causes. Now that word God in Greek is theos. It means the God had the Almighty. In other words, above us, above mankind, not limited like we are, that God, the Almighty. What is God? Think about it for a moment. What are the attributes of something declaring itself to be divine in God? If God does not portray these following attributes, they're not a God. That that person must be omnipotent. In other words, omni meaning all, and potent meaning powerful. Omnipotent. All powerful. They, They can't have anything that has more power than them, or they're not God. They have to be above everything in power. They must be omniscient, all knowing, right? There's nothing that can have more knowledge than God, or they're not God. They must also be omnipresent, everywhere at all times. They can't be limited by flesh and blood. Otherwise, they're not God. And that's why we don't worship idols that are subject to time and space. No, we can have things that might remind us of God, but we don't worship that thing, because God is beyond time and space. He is omnipresent. He created time and space. How does scripture begin? In the beginning. That's time. 
He created time and space. But there's a fifth quality that, so far, if, if something had those attributes, are you safe? I hope you don't feel safe. Because what happens if the thing that has those attributes is a mean, angry, judgmental God? You're not too safe. Because he's going to come on you and he's going to say, How dare you violate my law? I'm going to crush you with my omnipotence because I know what you're thinking because I'm there with you. No, there's another attribute that's vitally important to know about God and that is the term omnibenevolent. Perfectly benevolent. All loving, all caring. Without that attribute, God would be a tyrant. And this world knows all about tyrants. Dictators, monarchs love the power that they have. But they may not be benevolent. In fact, they most likely aren't benevolent. But God is. The God of the Bible is perfectly benevolent, perfectly loving, perfectly caring. That's why we pray to him. Because he says, I care. He tells us in his word he cares. And we can share our concerns with him. He wants us to know. In fact, the word of God says in 1 John, I am love. So knowing that, that that's, that's the power behind this promise. God causes. Now the Greek word there is synergio. Sound familiar? Synergy comes from that. It means to work together help and work, to be a partner in labor, to put forth power together for something, or provide assistance. That's what synergy is all about. So God causes, he's the cause behind your animation, your working. So this God that has those attributes, he is the cause behind all things. All. Not just some things. All things. There is nothing outside of God's control. Now, you may think, and you may have a hard time reconciling some of the things that happen in this world and think, wow, God was behind that. It's easy to see God behind the birth of Jesus. It's easy to see God behind the miraculous healing and salvation of somebody or the wonderful thing that might come about. But then when an earthquake kills 10,000 people, you go, God is the cause behind that? How can that be loving? Well, that opens up our limitations, our weakness, because we don't know all things. God does. There is nothing outside God's control. If there is, he wouldn't be God. You see, the Greeks understood that, but they couldn't conceive of a God that had all things under their control, so they created all kinds of gods. We've all heard about the different Greek mythological gods. There were all kinds of them. Even Paul commented on the vast number of gods when he referred to the monument to the unknown God. They, they, they just knew there were so many gods out there, they figured, hey, I don't want to offend the one that we don't recognize, so let's make one that just says the unknown God so that he's not offended. You see, this way they could think they were in control. Well, if I can worship the sun god, then I can control the climate. If I can control the fertility god, then I can control population. All of their gods. So all God is the cause behind all things. And that's including the material and the immaterial in this world. Confirming that the creator is in control of what he created. That's almost a duh statement. He created it. We accept If you accept him as the creator, then you have to accept that he's in control of that creation. Now there have been people in the, in the history of this own country and, and throughout the world that ha didn't have a problem with a powerful being, but they had, didn't like the idea that he was involved in their lives, and they formed a, a system of thought called deism, meaning, oh yeah, there's, God created all this, but we're in charge. 
I'm in control. God's not. Don't bother praying to him because he's sleeping. He's put us in charge of this wonderful creation. No, that's a violation of this wonderful verse right here, that God is the cause of all things. And we know that God causes all things. We're going to pause there until next week. We've just begun to unfold the truths of this wonderful verse. And I hope I've got you on the edge of the seat to find out what is to be shared next week. I want to encourage you to take this verse and commit it to memory this week. I know it's hard to memorize scripture. I have a hard time memorizing scripture. You know, they teach you ways to memorize scripture, and then I forget those ways. You can write it down on a card. Recite it when you get up. Recite it when you go to bed. Think about it during the day of this week. So that's my challenge to you this week. Read through this verse every day. Think about it each day of this week. It is a wonderful verse. And we've just gotten to start to realize the wonderful truths of this verse. That this is a a knowledge that we know because the Holy Spirit reveals it to us. That God is the cause of all things in our life. The beginning of this verse truly sets the stage of the wonderful comfort of the remainder of the verse. And it goes on, to work together for good. God is the cause of all things. And he's going to work together for good to those who love God. What a wonderful promise. God is working out a plan in this world. And that plan is not for your comfort. That plan is not to just, you know, make everybody happy. No, that's not his plan. His plan is to reveal his glory. That's why he created the world. He didn't have to create this world, but he wanted to to demonstrate his glory. And he created the world and the universe. And the crowning glory was mankind. And unfortunately, mankind died. Mankind sinned and died. But he didn't leave mankind alone. He didn't just say, okay, forget it. We're going to erase the board. We're going to start over. No, he said, I'm going to put forth a plan to redeem that mankind. And to those, I promise, I will work everything out for good. Now, the working out of that plan might be ugly. It might be hard. In fact, it probably will be. However, the end result is guaranteed because God has said it in his word. If God ever says something that he is not able to do, then he's not God. And he's bold enough to make this wonderful promise to us today. His children know these things because the Holy Spirit discloses it to us. One of the assurances of your salvation is the knowledge of things like this. We are not always given the specifics of how he brings about good, but we can live with the assurance that he will. That's called faith. Trusting God. Lord willing, next week we will look into the remainder of this wonderful verse. Let's pray. Oh Lord God, thank you for being God, being a loving God. And thank you for this wonderful promise that you have given to us today. Reveal to us through your Holy Spirit the wonderful knowledge of truly what it means to have you on our side, to have you as our Father, to what it means to be a joint heir with Jesus Christ. The working out of your will in this world is not pretty. It involved the horrors of the crucifixion. But that was to bring about the wonderful good purpose of our salvation. Thank you, Lord God, for being willing to do the hard things on our behalf that we can experience the wonderful glories of being in your family. May everyone know 
that truth this week. We pray this in Jesus' name.